How did you become a follower of Jesus Christ? I've asked that question many times. I always enjoy listening to the answers. Almost always there is a person or a group of people who have been involved in being able to help people become a follower of Jesus. It's been true since the very first disciples of Jesus took their steps of faith to follow him. Now, the word we use to describe that process through which people become followers of Jesus, it can be intimidating. It is the word evangelism. Evangelism. I have found two surefire ways to make sure you don't have a crowd show up. You can say we're going to have a session where all we're going to do is pray and for some reason we don't show up. The other is we're going to have a seminar on tips on how to lead people to Christ and we don't show up. Evangelism, it doesn't need to be an intimidating word. It merely is the first step in the discipleship process. Here's what we're going to see today as we observe the first five people who said yes to following Jesus. We are going to see three different methods of evangelism in the verses in John at the end of chapter 1 that we look at. The three methods by which these disciples became followers. We're going to look at four barriers. One of the reasons we find evangelism intimidating is the barriers that we might encounter. They are common barriers that we don't need to fear. And then we're going to see four personality types. The the invitation to follow Jesus, it's intended for all people. People are not all the same. And we will see how the invitation to follow Jesus and to experience the love of Christ, it's personally designed to connect with four very distinct personality types. And our goal is to make sure that we respond to Jesus' call to follow him. And so, Lord Jesus, that is our goal today, to be able to see how you interacted with those first five people who followed you as that invitation was given. And as we do that, to be able to see where we are in our own walk with you, uh, whether we have responded or we still need to respond, or if we've responded that perhaps we've drawn back, And we're not as dedicated as we should be. And so, Lord, we just give this time to you and ask that you would speak through your word as we see how you interacted with these first five men who followed you. It's in your name, Jesus, as we seek to follow you that we pray. Amen. So a quick review of where we finished last week. It's needed as we're ready to look now at what is the third day of Jesus' public ministry. Uh, The first day, if you remember, was when John the Baptist was questioned by the Jewish religious leaders because they wanted to see and make sure where he was coming from. On the next day, John sees Jesus coming and he calls attention to him and he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now it's day three. That means it's the third day since Jesus returned from the 40 days that he spent in the desert being tempted by Satan. We read, the next day... John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. That may be the shortest evangelistic message ever preached. And the response was immediate. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. A striking example of John the Baptist's attitude that he had to become less so that Jesus could become more. It's natural for us to want to hold on to what we see as belonging to us. Uh, The disciples, making disciples just like making an eagle scout, it involves an investment of time and energy. And you hate to see that process fall short. John tells his two disciples, look, the Lamb of God, and they follow Jesus. That's amazing. The evangelistic method that's used here is a preacher's message. Different than other methods we see here, John's spoken words are what drew them to follow Jesus. Some of you became believers that way. I did. As a 10-year-old boy, I responded to the invitation at the close of a service by going forward to pray at an altar to receive Christ. 
I identify with these very first followers of Jesus. It was that spoken message. So John the Baptist illustrates for us the greatest message that we can preach. If you ever have the chance to preach a sermon, three clear words to proclaim are, look at Jesus. If you don't get beyond that, you have preached an incredible sermon. John said, look at Jesus. His two disciples stopped following him so that they could follow Jesus. Without hesitation, they followed. The barrier I see here is many times we confront traditions of the past. In order to follow Jesus, these two disciples had to overcome the tradition of what they knew at that point. They had to stop following John the Baptist to follow Jesus. Following John had been really good. He was preaching repentance. People were flooding out of the city to come and listen to him, to be baptized. It was exciting. It was the it place to be. And they had to give that up to follow Jesus. Tradition is a common barrier for many people. Our past, especially traditions that we have developed, it can block us. Uh, the ways in which uh, our families have practiced faith, they may be different. And the traditions, they may have meaning, uh, but they never quite connected us to Jesus by calling us to follow Him. We're going through the motions, but the relationship isn't there. The reality is that church and the things that we do sometimes at church, they can become traditions that keep us from following Jesus. That could have happened with these two disciples. For them, it was an issue of leaving their mentor, John the Baptist, to follow their master, Jesus the Messiah. They were leaving their teacher in order to find the truth. The personality type I see reflected here is that, um, if you're familiar with the DISC test, it's that sanguine I personality, that influential personality. Andrew and John, they follow immediately. We can call them by name now. Andrew is named in the next few verses, while the name of the other disciple, John, never given. That's why we know it had to be John who wrote the gospel. John never identifies himself beyond being the disciple that Jesus loved. As we read about Andrew and John in other places, we see they are people who value relations. They are people people. They fit that sanguine personality type. If you're familiar with the DISC profile, they are the I people that are reflected up here in the 12 to 3 o'clock position. Inspirational, interacting, intera interesting, influential, as they like to be with people. If you like the animal style of uh, identifying better, uh, that playful otter, that's uh, the second one in. That's your I person who just uh, loves parties, people, and being playful. For Andrew and John, having a relationship is the priority. That's what I people love, that relationship. They love people. And so Jesus helps them to follow by beginning with a question. It's a question that moves them toward this relationship. These are the first words spoken by Jesus in this gospel. They are, what do you want? What do you want? Now, I think Jesus' tone was probably more inviting than the tone that we usually use when we use those words. I think it's an open-ended question, he asked them, to help them consider what they're really looking for in life. And they don't appear to hesitate at all. They said, Rabbi, which means teacher. And John here is helping us to know that he's trying to connect with others because he had a Greek audience that wouldn't maybe have understood that a rabbi was a teacher, so he makes it clear, where are you staying? If you are a relational type of person, that makes sense to you that that's the first thing out of your mouth. They want to see where he's staying. They want to see what it's like to be around him. And so John, the gospel author, also lets us know that, that uh, he wants to make sure that everyone is connecting with that teacher word. We'll see him do that a couple of times. And so Jesus invites them to come and see come and see. John here is writing about the day that changed his life. 
This is the first day that he met Jesus. He had heard about him, may have seen him along the way. Now his invitation is to go with Jesus and spend the day with him. At a later time, when John was with his brother Peter at their fishing boat along the Sea of Galilee, he would respond to Jesus' invitation, follow me, and change his life's work. Two separate events. This essentially is John's salvation story that's told here. It's the day he made that first step to follow Jesus. His call to ministry was that place where he left his previous vocation with the fishing boat behind. If you're a sanguine, this is your kind of story about having a relationship with Jesus. Well, Andrew, being that relationship person, his first thought is, I need to find my brother, Simon, to tell him about Jesus. The more people at the party, the better. And so we read, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon, and tell him, we have found the Messiah And then for that Greek audience, that is the Christ. The evangelistic method here is personal witness. And when we think about evangelism, this is typically the method where we focus. And the one that intimidates about us is that my mouth needs to say something about Jesus to help other people follow him. Here, one man goes to his brother, tells, here's what we have found about the Lord. He says, we have found the Messiah. Andrew and Simon, they're part of the countless numbers of faithful Jews who have been looking for and waiting for the promise of the Messiah to come true ever since it first started with Adam back in Genesis chapter 3. Andrew wants his brother to know that their wait is over. Just think of what this involved for Andrew. As you study these two brothers, you find Andrew was always living in the shadow of his older brother. Anybody identify with that? They fished together, but it would have been considered Simon's business by Jewish laws of inheritance. Andrew lived in his brother's house for a while. When Jesus later invited three disciples into his inner circle, Andrew was the odd man out. He lived in the shadow of his older brother as he still does today. I was thinking about it. Peter, as he became known, he has great cities named for him like St. Petersburg, in Florida, St. Petersburg, in Russia. Andrew, or Andreas in Spanish, has a major earthquake fault named after him. That's how he raised. Well, Dave pointed out he does have a great golf course in Scotland, too, named after him. The barrier we encounter here is pride. Pride both for Andrew, being able to escape the shadow of his older brother, and pride for Peter in his personality to admit that he needed something outside of himself. Andrew could have kept this to himself. He could have said, I have found the Messiah. But stepping past his pride, Andrew has the humility from the very beginning to include others in that exciting discovery. I'm going to take my brother to see Jesus. Bringing people to Jesus is Andrew's distinguishing trait. In John 6, we're going to see Andrew bring a young boy with his lunch of loaves and fish to Jesus. In John 12, we'll see it's Andrew who brings Greeks who are looking for Jesus to see him. They've gone to Philip first. Philip, we'll see why in his personality, he chooses to take them to Andrew, and Andrew knows just what to do. He takes them to see Jesus. It was Andrew's personal witness that results in Simon standing with Jesus. Look what happens at that point. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. These are the first words to Peter. Cephas is the Aramaic word meaning stone or rock. Greeks would call him Petros. He is going to be a solid rock kind of person, an anchor man that you could count on. That's his personality type, the choleric, the D, the dominant person, and that's Peter. Jesus' call is perfectly suited to Peter. He is the person who has to have purpose to fulfill, a job to do, and he will jump in with both feet to accomplish it. He was always the first one to jump in. It sometimes ends up with him sinking, 
but that would never stop him from jumping. And so by giving him a new name, Jesus calls Peter to fulfill that new purpose. Some of you know exactly what this personality type is like. You don't care what it takes. You are going to be there. You are bound and determined that you are going to make a difference even if it kills you and everyone else around you. That's who Peter is. And Jesus knows exactly how to reach him. He gives him a life challenge. He doesn't say, come on over to my house and spend the day with me. He lets Simon know that he understands who he is and that he can be more than he ever dreamed possible. He can be a rock, the anchor of everything that will happen for Jesus missing to be fulfilled. If you have that kind of personality, you want to be in charge. Dominance marks this. It's represented by the mighty lion. Some of us need that Peter type of challenge. Uh, it's about 3% of the population falls in this place. It's probably good or we'd all be dead otherwise. <laughs> next, it's Philip. It's now the fourth day when Jesus calls his next follower. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He's going to go from the south to the north. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. The evangelistic method here is an interesting one. It is a direct invitation from Jesus himself. Philip wasn't brought to Jesus by a brother or a friend. He didn't hear the message of a preacher. Jesus came to him personally. He was sought out by Jesus. We'll see that happen later with Saul of Tarsus in Acts. We hear about it today from those who are involved in reaching out to an adherence of Islam, where Jesus... Jesus appears in dreams, calling individuals to follow him. I would also include, I think, people who picked up a Bible somewhere in a hotel room, perhaps, in a moment of desperation and turned to Jesus as a result of him speaking through the word of God. The barrier would be no one to bring that person to Jesus. There's no one to bring that person to Jesus. It's a barrier we can't break through in any other way than praying for people to be reached. I had a friend in college. He was raised in a family of um, avowed atheists. He told how Jesus appeared to him in a dream, after which he started asking questions. Someone then introduced him to a pastor who explained Jesus to Leroy. And what had happened in that dream, it was a miraculous testimony. The personality type of Philip most likely is that phlegmatic S, steady person, uh, makes up about 68% uh, of the population is what we are told. And so we learn how Jesus is calling a Philip. It perfectly fits with his laid back, reserved, easygoing style where he might not go out of his way to ever go seek out something for himself. It's kind of life happens and it's fun to watch it happen. If you are one of these steady people who never rocks the boat, you understand. You understand there was no way that Philip was really going to go looking for Jesus without being prompted. Do you know anyone like that? They are all right with whatever happens. They are nice to be around. They are always willing to help. It's the golden retriever. Everyone loves the friendly golden retriever. The greatest insight from this passage is how Jesus goes and finds the one who would never seek him out. We realize how Jesus can take a driven person like Peter and make something out of him. Jesus can do that with a disciple like Philip too. With people like Peter and Paul, Jesus has to tame that drive that they have, redirect it. There are others where Jesus has to stir them from their comfortable position where they sit and observe life and just get them moving. Jesus meets each of us in just the right way. Like Andrew and Peter, Philip is from Bethsaida. He immediately goes to find Nathaniel. 
Once he's found by Jesus, he does begin to tell others. We read, Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. And it's interesting here, he must have known the people in that area because this is one of the few times that Jesus is referred to as the son of Joseph. The evangelistic method, again, is personal witness. This time, however, the response is an immediate. Nathaniel has questions. And we need this example because the possibility of being asked questions when we begin to talk with people about the Lord, that's what can be intimidating to us. What's the question he asks? Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? There's a lot behind this question. Uh, Nazareth was located on a major trade route between two major cities where garrisons of Roman soldiers were stationed, and so soldiers often stopped in this small, out-of-the-way town. And if you've ever been in a military town where there are soldiers, there can also be activities of questionable nature that take place. And so Nazareth was a small town with a bad reputation, and it's the place where Jesus was raised. So how, Nathaniel wonders, can anything good come out of a place like that? We, we might say, Las Vegas? Can anything good come out of Las Vegas? That's the kind of question. The barrier here is this. Prejudice. Prejudice can often stop us from sharing Jesus with other people. Nathaniel had some preconceived ideas, making it extremely difficult for him to consider what Philip was saying, that it could actually be true. And many of us, I know, are afraid that if we start witnessing, sharing Jesus, we are going to be asked questions like this, questions for which we have no answers. Look at how Philip replies to the question. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see. He doesn't engage Nathaniel in debate or try to answer his objections. He simply says, come and see. Come to the No Regrets Conference with me. Come, come, come and see. He invites him to come and check it out. The personality type here is the melancholy, the see, the careful person, that fourth personality type. He is the melancholic who is concerned with the details and wants to make sure that everything is in order and all the answers to every question that you could ever possibly have, it's finally answered, and all you end up doing is going in circles. So Philip's answer, like, like the beaver, being able to make sure that it's built right, everything in place, those beaver houses are solid. So Philip's answer, come and see, it's perfect, because he's never going to believe it until he checks Jesus out for himself. This is where we see how well Jesus understands when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Here's a guy who's got it all together. The Israelites were descended from Jacob, who was given the name Israel by God. Jacob was a man marked by deceit. He was a schemer. One translation reads, This is an Israelite in whom there is no Jacob. It is the biggest compliment a person like Nathaniel could have been given. Everything that needed to be done, it's been done. And Jesus recognizes that he is an honest, transparent person who is going to ask the questions that need to be asked. Thomas is another disciple cut from the same cloth. Nathaniel is intrigued enough to ask another question. It's a question you might expect. How do you know me? How do you know me? Jesus doesn't hesitate in answering. I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. The Greek word for saw here used, it's different than the word in verse 42. There Jesus looked at Simon, saw him physically. This word means I, perce I perceived you. I saw you and understood you. And that's all it takes for Nathaniel. Nathaniel declares, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And I wonder how on earth did he have his question answered by that? Well, here's what happens. What convinces him? 
In that day, Jewish writings contained in the Talmud were read by Jewish men who wanted to worship God. They were expected to meditate on those once a day in a quiet place. It was suggested that this be under a tree. Most Jewish men chose a fig tree because the branches of the fig tree dropped down sometimes all the way to the ground. This would be a protected hideaway where a person could be alone and unseen, and Jesus saw him. Jesus saw him miraculously and affirmed what he knew about Nathanael. Jesus knew his background, that he was a true Israelite, no deceit. He knew his character, nothing false about him. He knew his heart that he worshipped. Even the person with questions can find Jesus. And when that happens, it results in a deep, committed faith. Have another friend. Uh, he's an aerospace engineer. Uh, Jeff and I, we comprised a double play combination uh, on a softball team for a number of years. An aerospace engineer who came to faith over a period of years, finally at 30 years of age. And as an engineer, he had questions. A series of friends lovingly and patiently answered his questions. And when he believed, it was with an unwavering, convinced faith. And then Jesus finishes his master class. We need to finish. John 1, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open." And the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is no longer the Son of Joseph. He is the Son of Man, a favorite messianic title. He reminds this Jew of the story of Jacob found in Genesis 28, where Jacob laid down to sleep using a stone as his pillow. There aren't going to be any commercials about that pillow. You know, the stone pillow, sleep like a rock. That's not going to be... He has this dream while he's sleeping of a ladder reaching up to heaven with angels ascending and descending. In my mind, I see it as kind of an escalator. And in that dream, God says to him, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your grandfather, the God of Isaac, your father. I will give your descendants the land on which you are lying. And Jesus tells Nathaniel, you'll see this happening with me as the son of man. I am Jacob's ladder. I am the way in which people will access God. God reaching down for them and then us reaching up to follow. I love the way Jesus explains that to the one person who would get it and care about the truth that Jesus reveals. And so today we see this passage of how Jesus calls each of us and the way that we individually need to be called. You can use this when you're telling people about Jesus. Is it someone who needs a challenge? Is it someone who needs a relationship? Is it someone who needs to be nudged a little bit? Is it someone who needs to have their questions answered? We can do that because Jesus calls you that way. Jesus calls you for who you are and who you can be in his kingdom. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the way in which you were able to call each and every one of us and my prayer continues to be that as you call us in the way that we need to be called, that we would respond and that we would follow you. Jesus, in your name we pray.